Welcome back to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Sonship Review Part 8, and this is Session 39. We're in the midst of looking at these verses that was actually, give, I was giving you evidence to show you that the things that uh, they were saying about not knowing about him, nobody coming to tell him anything, uh, wasn't valid. We ended there in Mark chapter 1, so let's take a look at this next one. Luke chapter 4, verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And that's at the begin that's at the very beginning of his ministry. Right after he gets baptized by John, he's fasted for 40 days, he goes in the wilderness, tempted by the devil, and when he comes out, the thing the fame is already spreading from the very beginning. Here's the next one, Luke 4:37. And the fame of him went out into every place of the, uh, of the country round about. And then uh, Luke chapter 5 verse 12. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Why in the world would he think that unless Jesus had already been doing things that, I mean, you know, made the guy, no, I, he can do it. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Anybody that watched that, that would have obviously blown them away. The news of that would have spread everywhere. And so, uh, let's keep reading here. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing, according as Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Don't you know that anybody that had any kind of disability or infirmity or disease or sickness, if, if he touches a guy and his leprosy is gone, you know what they're doing? They're, I'm, I'm going to see him. Of course. Doesn't that make you wonder how in the world could the majority of the Israelites have rejected him? How in the world could they have done that? It certainly wasn't for that reason what we've been reading in Romans chapter 10. So, uh, and, and again, I just want to remind you, I know there wasn't social media back then and things didn't fly around like they do now, but believe me, in a nation the size of Israel, that word got around from one end to the other. Everybody knew who that was. And what Paul is saying is that Israel is without excuse. That this, is a, this is a flimsy way to try to blame God for the predicament that they're in. Because many of those people have witnessed those miracles. They saw those things with their own eyes. And, uh, uh, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to get to the next one, which is when that did, doesn't work, what they're going to do now is they're going to give a second excuse. And so now we're going to uh, look into that. And um, here's, the, here's, here's where the blame is going to go this time. Okay, okay, Paul, okay. So it's not that God didn't send anybody. You know what this reminds me of? When someone doesn't want to do something... They, all, it, 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 they always come up with eight different things hoping that one of them will be enough to, you know, give them the excuse to not do it. Yeah, didn't have milk, so right, okay, like Barbara gave the excuse. She didn't have milk. But you know what? God gave her feet, right? Okay, no, I'm just kidding. He gave milk a car. <laughs> Actually, God didn't give it to him, but you know what? Milk gets to use it, right? Okay. All right, so here it is. Yeah, Mel saying, if God gave it to me, how come I'm making the payments? <laughs> That's what he's thinking. Okay, right. So, <laughs> I'm sorry, Barbara got me off now. I don't even remember what I was doing. I <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh, the second excuse. So, okay. So here it is. See, it doesn't take much to get me sidetracked. So here it is. All right, so, okay, Paul. Just, like you said, God sent preachers. And he even said that he was going to be sending preachers to this generation, and we should have been expecting them. By the way, if they had re really been looking at this the way they should have, they should have been expecting these guys and looking forward to them with joy to hear their message. 
They weren't doing that at all. In, in fact, th they didn't even want that. Okay, so now they're going to say, okay, so he did send somebody. He did. But you know what? We couldn't make out what they were saying. It was very confusing and, and, and contradictory and, and garbled. And we couldn't make sense of it. it, it it's not our fault because, you, yeah, God may have sent some guys, but we couldn't make any sense out of what they were saying. How in the world were we supposed to understand that that, that was the Christ? Because they, they, were, they just weren't very clear about it. <laughs> and so in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 to 21, Paul is going to address this excuse. And he's going to say to them, you guys did understand their message. It wasn't unintelligible. It wasn't garbled. It wasn't unclear. In fact, you absolutely understood it, which is why you rejected it with such animosity, with such hatred. And so he's going to give, give them some things about that. So here it is, Romans chapter 10 and in verse 16. Oh, did I skip that? I didn't mean to. I guess we talked about it at the break, and I had it in my head. All right, so look. What, what, all of his fame is going everywhere. What, why was I doing that? Oh, I guess I was making a point there that... Let me just look back and see. Oh, it's not even in your notes, is it? Yeah, I was saying, you know what? They should have been looking forward to that with joy. And I was going to give you a verse to say, instead of looking forward to this with joy and anticipating those prophets... What they did, exactly what Matthew 21 described that they did. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him and seize on his inheritance. That's what they were thinking. By the way, they had to know who he was to say that, didn't they? Yeah. See, this whole idea about, well, we didn't know. That's who that was. Yeah, they didn't know who that was. Okay, so now, Romans 10 16. But they have not all, all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So when faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the... So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I'll anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now, verse 16, let's kind of take a look at this. There's several things that Paul is pointing out here. And the main idea is, it's not that you guys didn't understand the message, it's that you didn't like the message. And so you rejected the message based on what you understood that it had said. So, same response once again. Uh, he's calling up Isaiah. He's going to show them the same response you guys gave to the prophet is the same response that you gave to those that were proclaiming the message about Jesus. So, how do we know that Israel understood the message well enough to believe it. Well, verse 17 tells them, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, you had everything you needed to believe this message. And the message he's going to demonstrate was not all garbled where they couldn't understand it. So, let me take you to John chapter 5 and verse 18. I'm showing you that they understood the message. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Why? Because they didn't understand the message that was being said about him? Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also God was his father, making himself equal with God. Was he? He was God in the flesh. That's exactly who the son of David was supposed to be. They understood exactly who he was. By the way, can you imagine... The religious leaders in Israel, they didn't really understand clearly what was being said, but two blind men knew exactly who he was. How did that happen? Um, Matthew chapter 26, verse 63. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said to him, 
Now tell me again who it is that you say that you are because I really can't understand who you're claiming to be. No. He says, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us rather thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Why would he even ask him that question unless he understood that was the issue? See, there was no garbled message to this. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, that may look innocuous to us, but when Jesus makes that statement, the high priest knows exactly what that means. That has meaning to it. We're going to finish the passage, but look. Hereafter you'll see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. Sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now he knows what that means, that title Son of Man and those actions. So look at the next verse. Then the high priest rent his clothes. He tore them as though some great anguish saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his blasphemy. Wait, you notice what he didn't say? Does anybody know what that means? You'll see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of glory. What does that mean? What are you talking about? Oh, no, no, no. He knew exactly what that meant. So what does he do? Oh, he emphasizes what great anguish. Oh, I can't believe he said that. Tears his, his robe. Oh, now why do we need witnesses anymore? He's committed blasphemy. See, he knows exactly what is going on with that. Now, um, John chapter 10, verse 33. The Jews answered him saying, oh, by the way, they were going to stone him. He had done all these miracles, and they were going to stone him. And, and, and Jesus answered and saying, well, he asked me, he says, for which of my good works are you going to stone me? So here's the answer. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. See, if he's the son of God, even if he's the son of David, they know what that is. So see, they're not, they're not going to stone him because they can't understand what he's saying. They're going to stone him because they do understand what he's saying. And by the way, in the extension of mercy, I'm fixing to give you a verse in Acts. What Peter says about him, it's not garbled, it's crystal clear. And here it is. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye cruci crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's pretty plain, isn't it? And no one at the end of that goes, what are you trying to say? They know exactly what that is. So the, the excuse that, well, okay, God, okay, we, we, we'll give you that. God did send some guys, but their message just wasn't that clear. Not true. It absolutely was clear. Now the third excuse. <clears throat> this is like Israel is saying, okay, God sent preachers, and they did tell us, and we did understand what they were saying. But, I mean, can you, I mean, I got to tell you what this reminds me of. I came in from school one day, I was in high school, I came in from, uh, from school one day, and m my mom and dad and my little sister is 10 years my junior. She's going to hate that I'm telling the story again, because I've told it before. I don't know if I've told it here, but I used to tell stories on her all the time, so everybody would understand who the good child was, and okay. So I come in, and there's my little sister. And uh, so if I'm 17, that would have made her seven. I was, I'm, could have been a year younger, but, and my mom, so when I walk in the door, my mom immediately looks at me and she says, okay, Buster, you're in trouble. What did I do? She said, you took, a, do you, it, you may not even know what this is. Do you know what potted meat is? All right. She said, you opened up a can of potted meat, and evidently you didn't like it, and so instead of throwing it away or putting it in the refrigerator, 
you hid it in the cabinets behind the plates and bowls until an odor started up and my mom was going to hunt that odor down and she found it. And she said, you, I can't believe you did that. And I said, Mom, think for a minute. Who is the only person standing in this room that doesn't know not to put an opened can of potted meat in a cabinet? And then every eye looked back at my sister. And my dad said, let's go to your room. And she went, Dad, I tell you the truth this time. I tell you the truth this time. I opened it, but I'm not the one that put it in there. He said, let's go to your room. She said, wait, 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 wait. I put it in there, but I'm not. You see, and this is, this is exactly what they're doing, isn't it? You didn't send anybody. Yeah, I did. Let's go to your room, <laughs> so to speak. Okay, you sent somebody, but we couldn't understand what they were saying. Yeah, you did understand. Okay, we could. Okay, you did send somebody, and we did understand what they were saying, but not all of us got to hear about it. Just some. And that's not fair. Now Paul's going to answer this question. Now that my sister... See how, how easy this was to work that into the doctrine? Now that my sister has made it easy for us to understand the doctrine... By the way, when she was going down the hall, I have to finish the story. I heard her at just before the door closed, the back bedroom. She went, i tell you the truth this time, and then the door closed. And I looked at my mom, and I went, I bet Dad gets the truth before this is over. Well, you bet. But anyway, all right. I'm smiling. I can't help. I just reminisce. Okay. Those are good old days, right? She's going to hate me. Yeah. Yeah. Again. Um, Romans chapter 10, verse 18. But I say, had they not heard? Yes, verily. They're, and the reason I'm saying, here's how we know they're saying, okay, we heard, but not everybody. But look at this terminology. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Now he's quoting from the Psalms here. They would, they would know that. <laughs> It would be the equivalent of, I'm trying to think of a way that folks would do it today. Not many people read Shakespeare anymore, but if you came into the kitchen going, to be or not to be, that is the question. If you started with that, people would not look at you like, oh, he's about to start a conversation. No, you would know you're quoting from something, wouldn't you? Well, these people knew, just as apparently, that... Paul is quoting from the psalm. Let's go to the psalm read the passage. So Psalm 19.1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Here's the part Paul qu quotes in Romans. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Now when I was first working through this, I got carried away on this whole deal about what was going on here in Psalm 19. And you'll thank me because I've decided I can condense all this down into just a couple of sentences. What Psalm 19 is talking about, the fact that the, uh, the God consciousness, in other words, the ability to know there is a God, is actually displayed in the creation. Men come into the world with that understanding. Listen to me carefully. No one is born an atheist. A man becomes an atheist by his own deceptive self-imagination. He, he, he convinces himself or wants to convince himself that that is the case. And there's all kinds of, of degrees of that. You know, you could be an agnostic where you say, I, 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 we can't know if there's a God or not. And they act like, because I can't just look up and see him physically. I mean, maybe there is one, but maybe there isn't. We don't really know for sure. Isn't that great? Here's what the Bible says. Men come into the world naturally understanding this, and the very things of creation testify to that. Look... A watch. 
Let's suppose that you're walking along in the woods and you, you look at something and you reach down and you pick it up and it's a watch. Would you look at that and you would say to yourself, wow, look what has developed through time that all of these things have just come together in such a way that, man, this mechanism is doing this and, it's, and, it, and it keeps time. Wow, what a happy accident. Or would you believe there was a designer behind that? It's just because we don't think about it this way. But the things that are working in this world make the design of a watch look very elementary. Your own body is of such a, a nature. It is way more... Your eye alone is way more complex than a watch. Just your eye. Think about everything in your, that works in your body and how every, everything is taken into account. It's really an unbelievable... When the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that is really true. You know, I was, I was doing a little research this week, and, you know, there's this idea. We, I'm saying this on the tape, so if he hears this, he... Mm, maybe I shouldn't say this. I don't know. Look... Yeah, let me just do it like this. He already knows now. If he hears it, he knows I'm talking about him. But I'm not going to mention his name, so it doesn't matter. But there are, there are folks, and if you're one of the people that believe this, it's okay with me. It's okay. Just don't flinch, and I won't know that you're one of them. Okay? So, here it is. There, there are some folks who believe that you should not uh, drink liquid with your meals. And the reason they believe that is because all of those digestive juices get diluted. If you drink water or tea or whatever, it dilutes those digestive juices. And it takes longer to digest your food. It doesn't get digested as well and kind of slows the process down. So there are some people, oh, fooey, he doesn't care. You reckon he cares, Mark? I reckon Okay, I won't say it anyway. All right. I was going to have a little fun with him, but I don't know if he'd find it as funny as I do. So, anyway, um, there's a guy, Mark and I both know him, he's a really good friend, known him for years, and he's very um, adamant about the fact he's not going to drink anything with his meals. And that's fine. The way I look at that is, you can do whatever you want to. If you don't want to drink with your meals, don't drink. If you do, then do. I, it's, it's, I'm not going to make a law about it, you know. Well, anyway, in doing a little research on that, I found out that there is... Um, a process that your body does that if you have drank a lot of water and then you eat a meal and you actually have more liquid in your stomach than is necessary for digestion, your body automatically senses that and it pushes liquid out of the membrane of your stomach so that you have just the right amount of liquid to do digestion. If you don't have enough in your stomach because you haven't drank anything and you're not drinking anything during your meal and you actually needed more because of the way the membrane is in your stomach, it pulls liquid into your stomach. So as it turns out, you could say it this way, your stomach is pretty smart. It knows when there's too much and it adjusts and it knows when there's too little and it adjusts for that. And I found out that there's actually a name for that process, doctors are aware of that. So you don't really have to worry about, have you ever, look, sometimes when Bill and I are working in the yard and we come in to eat, and man, I just drink two or three glasses of tea just right in a row. Someone say, oh, you're never going to digest your food. But here's the wonderful thing. Your body does all that adjustment automatically on its own. How in the world does it know to do that? Well, there was a designer behind it. That's the point, right? There's this genius designer behind all that. All the little things that are working in you. Look, I, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to bring this up, but we take for granted marvelous things that are happening in our bodies every moment. Your balance, the ability for you to stand up or move or do whatever, that's, that's not an automatic thing. I mean, you know, when I had the stroke, I can remember 
Kim was over at the house. I'm trying to still put a connection between those two. But she's over at the house, and I had thought, you know, I was kind of dizzy and all that, and I thought, I'll just lay down for a little bit. Her and Billy are hanging out in the living room. I'm trying to get down to the living room. I fall over the coffee table on the floor. I can't stand up. Kim is going, get up. Okay, she's no, no, you know, no, no empathy. I mean, you know, you, the things of balance, you just think that because you're here, everything just happens. There's all kinds of things going on with you that allow your, your eyes to focus, that allow you to, to, to move without falling over, to be able to do the things that you're doing. It's incredible what happens to that. Now, I'm not trying to turn this into a lesson on that, but I'm trying to say is there's intricacy to just the creation of all the things that are going on in this body. Things that happen automatically. And you don't, you don't even have to think about them. Out here, I know you don't in your yard, we have some sand burrs from time to time. And if you step on one, because have you ever, you ever just walked out in your socks, you know better? You know better. But you do. And I've walked out in my socks, and I mean the sand burrs act like magnets. Here they come. I step on it, and immediately my foot comes up, my hands are, you know, my eyes are looking, let's pull this thing out. You know what you realize? Your whole body is working in concert for this one inch. All you had to do was feel that sand burr, and everything goes to work to fix it. Well, Ruby's laughing. Yeah, it's funny to you, right, Ruby? Okay, okay. Then you get stuck in your fingers, right, right. Okay, so my, <laughs> yeah, I know, she's been there, I know. So, so, here's, so here's, here, here's my point. This thing is so intricate. It works, it, it does the things that it does. Now, and when those things, you don't notice it until something goes wrong. But when it goes wrong, boy, then you start noticing things big time. And... Um, Anyway, my point is, when God put that consciousness in the world, everyone got to see it. Everyone got to experience it. A man can talk himself out of it. But look, he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, we know what the heavens are. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. That's his creation. Day and a day utter speech, and there are things that are going on during the course of a day that, re that make you realize there is a creator and there is a designer behind this. Night unto night showeth knowledge. And when it says there's no speech or language where their voice is not heard, he's not saying that they utter a, 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 a verbal speech. You know what he's talking about? The way they're talking is by the things that are absolutely evident to us during the night, during the day, all the things that are going on. And when he says their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world, he's saying there isn't anyone who isn't aware of this. Everyone is aware of this. Now, I know you and I don't think about it this way. There's not a way to illustrate it in here in the daytime. That light is not the same thing as someone in coming to you and telling you about God and reading to you from the Bible. That is a brighter light. But the things of creation do provide a light that can be seen. So if you didn't have the other, you, look, this is why Gentiles who never knew about the true and living God created all kinds of gods to follow and worship. Automatically, they blamed or gave credit to the gods for whatever was happening in their life. That's a, that's a thing that is built in. You have to talk yourself out of that if you're not going to be a part of that. Now, why, why is Paul... Uh, did that go off? Why is Paul quoting Psalm 19? Because the objection is, okay, God did send preachers, and we did understand their message, but not everybody got to hear it, so that's not fair. Everybody would need to be able to hear that. Well, when he goes to Psalm 19, he's saying, you know how this thing is here about the glory of God being communicated by the things of creation? 
By the way, can I just get you to turn to somewhere? Should have done it when we're doing it. Turn to Romans 1 and just look at this. I'm going to make one reference about this, and then I'll make the statement. In Romans chapter 1, he's, this is the same issue. So this is Romans 1, verse... He's talking about them being without excuse. Okay, verse 20. Um, 19, back up to 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's what he's saying. Even the things of creation will speak about this to such an extent that they're without excuse. So, I know we're not talking about the creation here, but here, here is what Paul is saying. Look, let's just go back to Romans and look at it. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. I'm just going to say this because we come back next week. We're going to pick this up about the ends of the world. I want to show you this. But when Paul is talking about knowing who Jesus is and how many people had an opportunity to hear the message, who is Paul talking to in Romans chapter 10? Unsaved Israel. So when he says here that the message about the Christ when he quotes out of, into all the earth and their words at the end of the world, he is not saying every Gentile knew about Jesus of Nazareth. What is he saying? Every Israelite heard about Jesus. Because even though they may live in some part of the world, they are connected still to Israel. Give me an example of how they're still connected. Feast days, there's major feast days. They've got to go back to Jerusalem to participate in those feast days. And although they may not travel every year, at some point they would go back. And when they went back, guess what they'd hear? Or you know what? Someone might travel there with news and say, you won't believe what's going on back home. There's a guy... He raised one of the ruler's daughter from the dead. These two blind men healed them. He started recounting all the, the unclean spirits obey him. Do you know how stories get embellished? It'd be pretty hard to embellish on Jesus because he pretty much did it all. But if people tell stories the way they normally tell stories, they wouldn't be selling it too short They'd really be talking about it. Here's my point. Paul is going to make this point. If you're an Israelite, it doesn't matter where you are, you heard. Just like in Psalm 19, everybody got a message. This thing about Jesus of Nazareth, don't get to saying, hey, there's just a few people that knew about that. We, we really were had no idea. I know this comes close to that and his fame spread throughout all the country and all that kind of business but you understand that when he says this here in Psalm 19 he said it doesn't matter even if you're not living in Israel if you're an Israelite you heard and I believe that's true I believe every one of them heard about that and made it, and they were going to make a decision but based on what they heard and God meant for that to happen now when we come back this is this is what Linda and I were talking about at the break this thing about into all the earth and the ends of the world. I want to prove to you that that does not mean every single person in the world, including Gentiles. It's just talking about the message went out into all the world, but to a particular people in all the world. I want to show you that. We're going to talk about that. Sandy will love this next week because this is going to get us over into the book of Revelation and I'm using that as one of the examples because it's going to talk about the, 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 
the amount of uh, influence that the beast is going to have out in the tribulation. Depending on how you understand the use of this phrase, there are some people who think it said the whole world wondered after the beast and he caused all to take the mark so that no one could buy or sell except they had the mark of the number of his name. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how that verse is talking about. It's not talking about the people. Look, I will guarantee you, I guarantee you, the people in the United States are not going to take that mark. The mark of the beast is not what will happen here. It will happen in the kingdom of the Antichrist. I'm not saying he doesn't have influence outside of his kingdom, but he cannot cause the whole world to take a mark. It's just going to be those in his kingdom. And the terminology that's used there, once you see it, you understand. So when we, we're going to take that understanding and a couple of other illustrations. We're going to come back to this and he's going to say, oh, well, you know what? If you're an Israelite, you heard about it. But it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean Gentiles in Belgium knew about Jesus of Nazareth. I'm not saying some of them couldn't have known, but it doesn't mean they did. It doesn't mean the Chinese knew who Jesus of Nazareth was. But a Jewish person living in China would have known. And that's a different issue. Anyway, we'll pick that up next week. And then what we'll do, because this is coming pretty quick now, we're going to finish chapter 10 and be in chapter 11. So, uh, because I think it's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's have prayer and we'll be done. Father, thank you for your word and what it says to us. And we do pray to understand it and uh, to be able to have this doctrine do the things that it is designed to do to get us established so that the, the particular pitfalls that we might fall into when we begin our education, those will all be taken care of up front. We won't have to worry about those issues or question what we're learning in the doctrine, but we can be absolutely persuaded by it. And all this preparatory work, this preliminary doctrine, will, will get us in just the position we need to be so when we're back in Romans 12 and the education itself, all these things can be generated in us and begin working. In Jesus' name, amen.